Good evening, everybody. I walked in my office this morning at 7.30 a.m. with sort of a panicked email from, from Dennis asking for uh, somebody with excellent vernacular ability and devilish good looks to come and introduce him today. So here I am. I'm not that great of a public speaker. My name is Seth Warren. Uh, I'm an alumni of Salter University. I graduated in 2011 with my bachelor's degree in uh, communication arts, which is where I met Dennis. And I'm getting ready to graduate again uh, in a few weeks with my master's degree in conflict analysis and dispute resolution. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about uh, how I got to know Dennis. Um, my relationship with Dennis started the same way that most uh, professor-student relationships begin. It was 6.59 in the morning on uh, registration day when you're getting ready to sign up for classes. And I was waiting to hit the refresh button on GoalNet so I could get into all my classes. And I experienced the same thing that many of you have probably gone through where you enroll and the class that you were trying to get into is not available anymore, so you have three minutes to sign up for a class before they're all gone or you take it next semester. So one of the classes that I had to take was the foundations of public speaking. And the only one that was available was, there was one unit, there was one class left, and it was, the instructor was D. Lee something. I couldn't pronounce his name. But I didn't have a choice, so I enrolled in it. And I went into class the next semester. And I sat down with Dennis, and Dennis went up, and everyone who's had class with Dennis knows that he gets up there and he writes, Dennis Alejandro Vegas Leosakis on the board. And he began with his lecture, and it was one of those classes where you could tell instantly that he was going to be somebody who was incredibly passionate about what he's talking about. He's someone who's very knowledgeable. He's very interested in making sure that the students also grasp the uh, concepts and uh, class material as well. Um, and I liked him so much, and I liked the way that he taught his classes so much, I went on and later took managerial communication, I took applied managerial communication, I took special topics uh, with him before I graduated. I sought his advice through uh, the graduate school application process, and he was there to shake my hand when he handed me my shingle for my induction into the Land of Hyatt Communications Arts Honor Society. Um, so I want to speak to you a little bit about uh, Dennis's ability to, to educate. I know that many of you students, you can sit in class, and I think everybody here has had this experience where you feel that teaching can sometimes be uh, a little bit passive. Um, there's a distinct difference between uh, teaching and educating, and I like to equate the difference of those two to hearing and listening, one being sort of a passive activity, and the other one being an actively engaged process through which somebody needs to take certain steps to be able to actively participate in. And, um, that educating, when I speak about Dennis, um, he's, he's always seeking to bring out the best in the student. He's always seeking to ensure that the student is on the same page that he is so that they can truly understand what it is that he's talking about. And uh, a shining example of that would be the, um, the class that I was enrolled with within the special topics 390 that was titled Photographic Autoethnography. Uh, um, basically, what photographic autoethnography taught the student was it gave them the ability to tell stories of people's lives and experiences through still photographs. Uh, it definitely focused more on uh, the photograph. There was a small writing piece, but you had to be able to take a picture and tell a whole story about somebody. And if any of you know anything about me, that was definitely not my MO, and I was completely lost. I spent the last three years trying to grasp organizational concepts of communication, how managers communicate with each other. And Dennis throws me this wrench that I have to take a picture of somebody and I have to tell a story about them. So he would pull me after class one day and he said, you seem a little lost. And I told him, I'm, I'm definitely lost. And from that class on, I stayed after every day, after every class. And he would look at my photographs and he would look at my work. And he would help me try to tell the story that I was trying to tell. And he would show me the way. And he would tell me what I needed to do in order to succeed. My first couple projects didn't turn out the way I wanted them to. And he knew that, but he also saw that. I was improving until our capstone project came. What we had to do is we had to tell a story about a family member of ours, someone who was very close to us, somebody who we were very close to, who knew a lot about us. I told a story of my mother, and I titled the project Boxes. And the story that I told was of my mother and how she helped hold our family together, uh, being a military family who we were never in one place for very long, so we were always moving. I told the story of boxes, how every house is just a box, which you try to make the box our own. And Dennis required us that we had matted the photographs with our writing, and we hung up the Lincoln Nations right up the hall for the entire school to see for a whole week. And I was like, Dennis, kill me. 
making me hang up, hang the stuff up. I have no idea what I'm doing. So we went up, and I hung up my work for the whole school to see on Monday night. And I woke up Tuesday morning, and I did the same thing that all college students do. Is they wake up and they check their Facebook. I, I got up, and I had a message in my inbox from a, from a girl who attends Salisbury University that I had never heard of before. And I opened up my inbox, and she had wrote a whole essay to me. And I was taken back. I said, what is this? And she went on to describe that the work that I had hung up had touched her so much that she began to cry as she was reading my work. And I went, no, that she can't talk about the same person. There's no way that's me. And she went on, and I kept reading. I couldn't believe that my story was so parallel to the story of hers that it moved her in a way that she just sat there in front of my pictures of my mother cooking in the kitchen that she just began to cry. And I, I was in disbelief until the next day it happened again with somebody that I knew and someone who was close to me was walking through the hallway and they saw my work and they said, Seth, I had no idea that you had this in you. I didn't know that you had this artistic side. And that's when it hit me because I realized I didn't know I had this either. And I realized that the only, the only way that made me realize it was that Dennis pulled that out of me. Dennis showed me that I am capable of, of ethnography. And I began to question, well, what other things am I capable of that I didn't know before that I was able to do? And I think that therein lies the true sense of an educator and what really lies at the heart of the true educator, someone who's able to make a student realize what they're truly capable of. So with that being said, I'd like to welcome up today's speaker, Dennis Lee Saunders. dry the salmon on long wooden wooden beams, and as the salmon would dry during the summer and into the early fall, it would get ready for them to eat during the winter. And then during the winter time, they would eat the dried fish and survive off of the dried fish. Now, this boy with the copper necklace, his name was Oktatsi. And Oktatsi said, man, it's like the end of winter, and I hate fish. I don't want to eat any more fish. His mother said, Tatsu, eat the fish, or the fish people will come and get you. Old superstition, that's baloney, I don't believe in that. So he went down to the river, and he started skipping stones. And he heard this murmuring sound. What's that noise? And then suddenly, standing before him, was a man with a long silver hair and a long silver coat. And he was standing there, stiff, proud as he could be. And he said, Oktatsi, come with me. Oktatsi said, I'm not doing anything. Sure, I'll come. So he started to walk out into the water. And suddenly he realized that murmuring the fish people. And he was traveling with the salmon plant. And he traveled down out of the bay into the Gulf and into the Pacific Ocean. 
And there he spent years with the fish people. He lived as the salmon boy, and he lived among the halibut people and shark people, the whale people, and he lived with all of the fish people until he started to get homesick. And when he started to get homesick, what happened was he started to come back to the place where he was born. And he started to enter the river by Angoon. And lo and behold, as he entered the river, there was his mother squatting down by the edge of the river, cleaning fish. He was so excited that he started to swim near the edge of the river. And he jumped out of the river as salmon will do and went, Yahoo! His mother just kept cleaning the fish. Well, he thought to himself, she must not have heard me. So he swam real close to the shore where she was. And he jumped out and went, Yahoo! And she grabbed him, took a knife, and slit his throat. Now that's not the end of the story. We're going to stop here for now. I'll get back to the rest of the story if I happen to forget, and I probably won't forget. But if I happen to forget, I'll get back to the story and I'll, I'll tell you the rest of it in time. You're going to see some artwork, and I'll, I'll go through it. This, this, this artwork happens to actually come out of Ketchup Can, and it was produced by a man named Joe Wilson. You're going to see artwork along the way. I'll try to identify some of the artwork that you have. The music that you heard was from Cusco, and that's a, an album uh, that they present. Um, kind of a new age, kind of mystical music. So it's kind of, kind of interesting music. That was music that came in. I want to tell you another story. At age 16, my mother got pregnant. Her boyfriend was also 16 and was Puerto Rican. My mother was Greek. Back in the year or in the day, that was a big fat number. White girls or Greeks of Greek heritage and Puerto Ricans were not to get married. The second thing was, she was 16 years old in 1948 and pregnant. And that's what they would call a willful girl. And so because she was pregnant, she was taken out of the home and she was put in the girl's home. And she was told, if you have this biracial child and you decide you want to keep it, you can no longer Stay with us. You are not a member of this family. And with that, I came into the world. She looked at me, and all of this is something that I only know because social workers told me this. I don't know this because anybody else has ever given me this information. This is the only word that I've gotten secondhand. So this is the only thing I know about my family. That check out the second hand. She took this child and said, This child should be put up for adoption. Between age zero, or age I was born, and five, I lived in a minimum of at least five different foster homes. I was put up for adoption adopted, and it was what they call a disrupted adoption. In other words, the, after I was adopted, the parents, for whatever reasons they had, gave me back. And then I became unadoptable. And so as a result of that, I was to live in foster homes for the rest of my childhood. At age five, 
I was living in a foster home that I kind of liked. And I liked this foster home because there was a mechanical horse around here. And I could go climb on a horse, I could leave out the top of one cat, whatever the cowboys were. And I also liked this house because they seemed to want <coughs> And I also liked this house because there were other children that I had children nearby that I could play with. And my first complete memory is standing on the curb in front of that house, waiting for a social worker to take me to another foster. That is my first complete memory. A little <coughs> kid standing there on a curb, waiting for a social worker to take him away. OK, so I've told you a really sad story here. <clears throat> Let's, and whenever I tell a story or tell some stories, I always ask the question, so what? You know, how do I make sense out of this? Well. Let's try to make some sense out of these first five years. What did I learn from this? <clears throat> now, some of you who are sitting in the audience may not like me very much. You may not like me because I'm small and dark. You may not like me because I talk fast. You may not like me because I'm your teacher and I'm not going to give you the kind of grades you think you deserve. You may not like me just because I have a slight New York accent, which I've been trying to get rid of all my life. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I sympathize with you because New York accents are distasteful. <laughs> I don't like them. But I'm asking you for a moment to suspend your distaste for me if you don't like me. Because that's how you will learn. There's lots of people that I don't like, but I listen to them because that's how I learn. So, so what? He just told us a story about growing up zero to five. The work that you see, the artwork of the mother and child that you just saw, was by Oswaldo Don Guayasamin. Guayasamin. <coughs> The quote about him was that he was a painter, and he says this about himself. I have painted for half a century as if I were crying in desperation. I have lived for half a century as if I've been crying in desperation. And here's some of the things that I've got from the first five years. One, life is not like a box of Cracker Jack. You're not born, you don't live till you get the prize, and then die happy. Two, human beings are like other primates. One, humans understand the inner makings of a child about as well as an orangutan understands a cell phone. Humans inherently know how to parent about as well as chimpanzees know how to produce fine art with a box of crayons. We are no different than the other primates. Security is measured by the number of promises kept. And every child will judge you based on the promises you as adults keep or do not keep. Taking children from their families is arming them with balloons and boxes of glass 
and expect them to understand the laws of life or the laws of physics. If you give a kid some balloons and a box of broken glass, you can expect a disaster. And finally, I learned that I was pretty damn insignificant. I had nothing to go on but empty promises, a shattered interior, a whole lot of hopes that were burst like balloons, and nothing but an iron will. I remember at five years old sitting under the table and saying, I am alone. I cannot trust anyone. Needless to say, I have attachment issues. Now, DSM Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders was around at the time that, uh, oh, it was around, I think, at the time that I was born. But I'm not, I'm not sure, 1948? Who's a mental health expert? 1948, did we have a DSM-3? A DSM, I think, we're going to be DSM-1. We did? Okay, so if it was around, OCC wasn't in there. OCC, or was it ODD, sorry, ODD. Oppositional Defiant Disorder was not part of it. Guess what? I was ODD. If you said white, I said black. If you said up, I said down. If you said this is the way it is, I said prove it. And, it's no, and there was a reason for that, because I didn't trust. I was this person who was not willing to bond with anybody, and so I didn't trust them. But with that, this whole sense of self, and it turns into a, it turns into a, a, what's the word for it? Let me think. I got to go back to that. Uh, it turns into a certified uh, conduct disorder at some point. If we look at me as a five-year-old now entering the school system, I went to PS 102 in Queens, New York. PS 102. I was living with a foster parents who were German in nature. Therefore, I thought I was German. For some reason, I believed I was German. And I went to, I went to school in BS 102 with all these kids that were Irish and Polish and uh, Italian, because that was an Irish, Polish, Italian neighborhood in that area where I lived at that time. And so here I was, this German kid going to school at you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine to 10 years old, 12 years old. And I thought I was white. Of course, when I got to class, or I got to school, I got called nigga, spit. What are you doing here? You don't belong in our neighborhood. The sixth graders thought that I was fair game because I was a second grader, so it was easy to kick my butt. And so I learned at a very early age to take care of myself, physically as well as the psychological. So I took care of myself in that manner. I was an out of control kid, absolutely out of control. Sixth grade, I had to come home with a note from my teacher every day. I have to say, um, he was good in school today. He didn't do his work. He did this work. When I was in the eighth grade, I got kicked off the bus for bringing fireworks to school. I kind of am a teacher by car. <laughs> it's kind of like the reason that I'm doing this is because it's the world paying me back to who I am. In high school, my first high school, Newtown High School, no, sorry, the first high school I went to was Martin Luther High School, being this 
religious kid, religious German, so you know it was Lutheran, right? Because I was German. I got kicked out of the first high school. When I went to my foster parents, they said, this is the worst kid this school has ever had. I didn't think I was that bad. Just because I started drinking at 12 years old, just because I got arrested at 14, I wasn't that bad. I went to Newtown High School, the public high school that has to take me. I got kicked out after my first year. Why did I get kicked out? Because I incited a riot in the dining room by getting a fight. We had the lunchroom, lunchrooms in the kids, kids break, break up by race. I don't have a race, so I can fight anybody I want. <laughs> Suddenly, the races start going on. The race war begins. I get kicked out because I incited a riot. I get sent to an orphanage. I live in this orphanage. I go to my third high school. This is where I really start doing drugs. Now, before I had just been drinking at 12, getting arrested for drinking. Now that I'm in the, the orphanage, I am so much better because I can totally take care of myself. So I start sniffing glue. Sniffing glue is a great pastime if you want to go into La La Land. That doesn't work. Alcohol doesn't work. I don't like the taste. I don't like the hangover. So I start doing pills. Isn't that the way to do it? Because then you don't have to hang over, and you don't have to worry about throwing up and all that stuff. You just take those and get ripped. Obviously, it didn't last in high school. I, got, I didn't get kicked out of that school. I left. I left at age 17 and went out on my own. And I've been on my own ever since. So what? You know, everybody's got a story. Every kid has a child. Every kid has an adolescent. Every kid was uh, a brat of sorts. I mean, that's what teenagers do. That's their job. You're supposed to go out there, and you're supposed to give your family, your parents, the people around you, the adults around you, a hard time. That's what you're supposed to do. I just did it to its streets. I just did it a little bit. I pushed the envelope a little further. So what do we learn from this stuff? That's the question. Well, one of the things that I learned from this was that there's no voiceless people. Only people who don't listen. You see, all I wanted was a family. Nobody heard that. All they heard was the white man. All they saw was my behavior. Nobody heard or took the time to really understand. The other thing, I was a little brown-skinned kid. I learned that size matters. And for those of your mind in your gutter, get it out. <laughs> I also learned that race matters. I also learned that crazy is a great way to teach. Yeah, it seldom has predictable results, but it has results. It helps me cope with insecurities, and it kept people off my back. A oh, man, don't mess with him, he's crazy. So for a little guy, little brown skin guy, this is the way to go. Be crazy. I also learned that I had no friends. I had no significant attachments. I learned that I was pretty independent. Now, independent can be good. But independent means you make your own decisions. And making your own decisions doesn't mean you always make good decisions. So I made my own decisions, but I made some really bad decisions. 
I also learned that girls and drugs work. I had a hole in my belly that was long ones. And I filled it with female companionship and dope. That was what I did. When rebellion is your purpose, you can do it with a just cause, you can do it with an unjust cause, or you can do it like me, just because. <laughs> with this great start, I then decided to become a man, an adult. 17, I walked away from the orphanage, and I never looked back. I couldn't make it. At 17 years, on my 17 years old, on my own, I couldn't make it. Flat out, I was taking pills, I was driving deliveries, I was sniffing glue, and I was failing in everything I tried. The only thing that I did that made sense in that time period was I went back to school and got my high school diploma. I then decided, I can't do it. I'm not a man. I don't know what it's like to be a man. Let me join the army. That wasn't the wisest decision I made. But it was a decision. And it had some great consequences, and it had some really bad consequences. Because this happened to be during the Vietnam War. Now, you take somebody during the Vietnam War who's a bit crazy, who's a bit rebellious, and says, I'm going to become a man by joining the army. Just becoming a little more crazy, a little more rebellious. So what do I want to learn? I want to learn. be a green beret. So I went and said, sign me up. I want to go to Vietnam. I want to kill them. I want to kill Vietnamese. I want to be a green beret. And so he said, okay. You're exactly what we're looking for. <laughs> and so I went to train. And I did go to basic training. I went to AIT, which is the second stage of training. I went to jump school, and then ultimately I went to special forces. And then I got to special forces, and ironically, I was a communication specialist, which is what my doctor is. And I was a communication specialist in Vietnam, I mean in, uh, in the Army, in the, in the special forces. And I hated it. I absolutely hated it. But I had this other side. This wild side that I hadn't completely buried with the military. So while I was doing my training and doing all that stuff, the military stuff, I started shooting heroin. Because, man, that was the best time. I never had to deal with getting sick anymore. I got the rush right away, and man, I didn't have to deal with life on life's terms. It was for me the perfect, the perfect filler for that loneliness and that void in my belly. And you know, as much as I hate to say it, heroin and special forces don't go along. <laughs> Needless to say, I ended up in military prison. But prison doesn't stop the army from sending you to Vietnam. Prison doesn't get you kicked out when there's a war going on. It just makes you right. It just kind of makes you ready for war. And so I got out of prison. I was doing pretty well. And they decided to send me to Vietnam. 
And uh, this is South Vietnam. This area up here is DMZ. I came in here, which is probably around uh, Cameron Bay. Everybody came into Cameron Bay. Some people got sent down here to the, uh, the area where the uh, marshes were. Some people went all the way up here, worked on the DMZ. Some people worked in the highlands. That was me. They could be in the highlands. The first, when I first got there, I went to An K. An K, I stayed there and held the base of An K with a group of soldiers while the 173rd Airborne Division pulled their colors and went home. After I was in An K, then I went up to Duck Bo and Chu Lai. Chu Lai, I stayed in that area with the Maritime Division. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Vietnam War, Chu Lai and the Americal were the division that covered the My Lai provinces. My Lai, for those of you who don't know My Lai, or the story of My Lai, go online. It's a wonderful place to learn about things like My Lai. Learn about war. I worked the My Lai provinces. And when I worked in the Milai provinces, it was about two years after the Milai massacre, which meant that Milai was openly hostile to American soldiers, and rightfully so, because American soldiers had done serious damage in that province, and for no good reason. But that's where I worked, up in the provinces in the highlands. But,
For those eight years, I lived like that. Until one day, I was going to my connection and said, what's wrong with you, man? What's wrong with me? And for the first time, I looked at me and said, for 30 years, you've been blaming your mother and your father and your foster care system, and your military, and your political system, and the people around you for what you've done for your life. And so you said, life stinks. Take it out on me, because me is the only person that I can control. So what? Now you're starting. Makes me feel bad for this poor guy. You know, look at him, look at him right in there. Poor guy shooting down on 110th Street. Shot a bag of dog and fell out of the street. That was me. Okay. So we say, so what? Let's make sense of it. Can I make sense of that? That's a question. Well, one thing I learned during that period of time was sex. Yes. Relationships and sexuality, much more complicated. I learned to view life, you can view life as a balloon, either as something to have really high hopes, like the future Green Beret, or absolutely gigantic, like an airbag that smothers you, like heroin. I learned that religious people and believers in God often find inner peace and comfort from their gods. But I, on the other hand, didn't have a clue. I felt abandoned by the gods, and to me, both life and God became a curiosity. I didn't have any hatred or anger towards the gods. I didn't have any love towards the gods. It's just, what's that all about? I also learned that war from a distance is an abstraction. It's a concept. It's something we talk about in the classroom. Up close, War is grief. It is inescapable, tormenting grief that I live with for the rest of my life. I've learned that death stinks. ODs, Vietnam, death just flat stinks. And I don't mean just that it's, it's a terrible thing or a bad thing. I mean, it smells. I mean, you can smell death. You walk into a room and you know somebody's dying because you smell it first. You walk into a, a room where body bags are laying out and you know it's dead bodies because you can smell it. Death stinks. <coughs> I also learned that sniffing glue and shooting alcohol are really bad ideas. I would recommend that you guys go try them. You know, and there are this, 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 this jackass guy, and he's a real jackass who shoots alcohol has made alcohol mainline on YouTube. So you can see the results of that if you like. But um, I recommend you don't try it at all. Live a life of crime or live a life as an addict 
This is what I'd suggest. Sure, you can do it. But I suggest, rather than doing that, get a real hobby. Make a hobby out of capturing wild lion cubs. <laughs> you know, it's safer. And probably the greatest thing I learned when I said, what's wrong with me, is I learned, and this is, this is kind of taken from the Daytop philosophy, which is a treatment center that I went to. I learned that there is no refuge from myself. Wherever I go, I am alone with my relentless self. That voice you hear in your head, you will never, ever escape. So, let's get to the end game. I have to be smarter than a clicker. <laughs> when I said, what's wrong with me? Basically what I did was I said, I need help. I need to find some way to make this right. Is there a secret? Is there something coming? No? Okay. We got we to do this. I had to say, what do I do? And I didn't know. After the first time I realized, I was totally ignorant. I had no idea what to do. And so I went into treatment. And I went into treatment and locked myself away. For 18 months, I stayed in treatment without any support system, just living in a treatment center with 160 other addicts. Addicts from all over New York City came to this facility and we lived together and formed a therapeutic community. The benefit for that was they provided a mirror, a glass mirror for me. And they allowed me to see myself and through the eyes of other people. I began to see how I was acting, how I was thinking, what I was doing. From Sun up to sun, sunset, I learned about myself. Now that's kind of self-involved, but I needed to do that because I had buried myself in drugs. I had so suffocated myself that I didn't allow myself to feel. I seldom cry. I seldom feel loss when I see death. And that's because my feelings have been suppressed for so long that it's hard for me to pull feelings out. It's hard for me to bond with people. And so for a year and a half, that's what I did. Then I went into an aftercare program where I was allowed to live in the treatment center and go and integrate, integrate and interface with the community for another six months. That's two years of solid treatment. And then there were six months where I stayed completely away and came back to ask to graduate. That's two and a half years of treatment. Now, a lot of people say psychotherapy, analysts, therapists, social workers, eh, they're a waste of time. One of the things that treatment does do is it gives you an opportunity, and it's a luxury in many ways, to spend time to look at yourself. And if you don't look at yourself, you don't know who you are. And if you do not know who you are, you will continue to make the same mistakes you're making if you're making mistakes now. And I got used to you. Everybody's making mistakes. So that was the luxury of treatment. 
But I had to be something after I got out of treatment. And who wants a recovering addict? I had nothing to show for myself but the fact that I was an ex-addict. I went back to college. Simple as that. I went to college. I got a degree in breakneck speed. I got a bachelor's degree. It is un it's unrealistic how fast I got my bachelor's degree. It is unrealistic how fast I got a master's degree. I started working in drug recovery because that's what I knew. And I knew how to do that. I spent two and a half years getting clean, so I knew how to do that. What I did was by doing that, I constantly reinforced in me healthy habits, ways to live, things to do that are do it right, how to be a functioning member of society. By doing that, I did that over and over and over again through my work. So I did it in my life and I did it in my work. I became a probation officer. One of the proudest days of my life is when I got the bed. Can you imagine an ex addict <coughs> eight years clean, getting a badge? Legally being able to carry a gun and handcuffs. Would you give me a gun? <laughs> I would. Then, I went and worked as a probation officer for about five years. And I went through a divorce. And when I went through the divorce, HIV had reared its ugly head. So I wanted to be clean. I wanted to prove that I was, remember I said sex, yes. I wanted to prove that I was clean, that I was good, that I didn't have this thing, the ninja. So I went to the test, and it came back positive. I was almost 40 years old. 40 years old, I'm starting to work towards redemption for the first 30 years. I'm 10 years into it now, and I get diagnosed with HIV. I was like a toxin. I came to the curb, I mean, I came to the edge of the river, jumped up, I went, yeah, I'm lightweight. I thought I was going to die. I thought I had two years to go. Everybody who got diagnosed at the time I got diagnosed, 1987, was told, you have a two-year sentence. You know, do what you have to do, make your amends, you're ready to die. Well, let's go back to the story of a toxin. I don't need you to remind me I'm there. Oh, toxin. Comes back. Goes to the edge of the earth. Jumps up. Goes out. Okay. When mom goes like that with the knife, she hits something metallic. What? Metallic? Fish? That's not a normal fish. What is this? So she goes to the shaman. She says to the shaman, listen, I went to cut my throat, this is fish's throat, and I ate something to die. What's wrong? The shaman looks at the fish and says, that's no ordinary fish. That's your son, Otatsi. What? Otatsi? Well, what am I supposed to do with this? He said, well, take Otatsi, put it on top, of the, the, the fish drying thing. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> we call it a thing. We call it a thing in Alaska. I live there. We call it the fish drying thing. I go, put the fish on the thing. <laughs> put it on top of the fish drying thing, and let's see what happens. So the fish sat up there, and the rains came in the fall. And when the rains came down in the fall, they washed Otasi's scales away. And Otasi slid off the roof. He was a fine young man. Not only was he a 
decline of man. But he had the wisdom of the sea. And so he became this shaman who was able to, to judge and tell the people when the rains were coming and when the fish were coming. And he'd be able to help the village and the clan, and especially the people of the salmon clan, fish and make a living and live. And when he died, they took him and they put him in the ocean. Where today, he lives by the caves around Ketchikan. And when the storms rise, they hear the water rise and hit against the rocks. And they know that bad weather is coming because of that. It's still speaking to them from the echo. All right, so what? Right, we have, we have to ask the question, so what? You can't just tell stories and not make sense out of it. Although we can. Lots of people do it. I can. Well, one of the things that I've learned from growing up, and it took me a long time to grow up, I envy many of you freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors that are here today. I envy you because you learn things that it took me years to learn. I learned that I'm a multifaceted person. No one thing defines me. Not my race, not my religion, not my size, not my past, not my behavior, not my role, not what you think of me. Not one of those things defines me. I am many things. I have many lives and many selves. I find it strange that death has had no interest in me. I had planned to die by age 30. I was the anti, oh, they think they're going to live forever. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to be dead at age 12. I thought I was going to be dead at age 21. I thought I was going to be dead in Vietnam. I thought I was going to be dead on the streets of New York. I thought I was going to be dead when I stood there behind, stood there in the hallway and said, what's wrong with me? And I realized that death just had no interest in me. I thought I'd be dead when I had HIV. I've been living with HIV for now over 25 years. I don't know why. I don't have an answer to that. I found out, or I believe, that redemption this idea of I need to make up for my past sins. Redemption does not provide refuge for my past. I am who I am. And I am a culmination of everything that I've experienced, good and bad. There is no redemption. And there is no refuge. And would I have it to do over again differently? I would. I would not be the young man that I was. I'm ashamed of who I was before I was age 30. I'm proud of who I am today, but I'm ashamed of who I was. I learned that curiosity saved my life. I wanted to learn. I wanted to be educated. I wanted to sit in the classroom. And I wanted to know the things that I didn't know. Education, curiosity, saved my life. Had I not done that, I would still be a homeless bum shooting, at, shooting heroin today. For instructors out there, 
I learned that if you want to build a ship, you don't go out and drum up the women, the men and women to gather the women, to divide the work and give the orders. Keep your fingers crossed that I have the source of this quote right here. <laughs> The wisdom of the sands. This comes from the wisdom of the sands. You don't drum up the people and give the orders. You teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. And for those of you, like me, who get lost in the ocean of reality, find satisfaction doing something nice. That's all it takes. Do something nice. All of my experiences boil down to I want to go to bed and put my head on the pillow and say, I did something of consequence, something nice. Day. Don't hold other people to your standards. And don't hold them to your standards if you struggle to hold yourself to those standards. So if you say to a person, I don't like liars, and everybody has a hard time telling the truth, because they want to make themselves look good, how can you hold others to your standard? Work to find a mutual agreement, a mutual place. Our greatest, boss, our greatest problem is like bottles of ketchup. No matter how you hit them, it's coming out. Usually the problems are going to work their way out. Don't take your lovers or your friends for granted. Just because they share their time or their bodies or they do something nice for you does not mean that they are obligated to you. Your partners do not owe you because they cooked you dinner or because they slept with you once, or because they cleaned your house once, or because they worked and brought home money to you once. They do not owe you. It's a negotiated relationship. If you're going to marry, marry a friend, not a work in progress. You're not going to fix your soul. Breakups are rough. They're some of the hardest things I ever had to experience, whether it be a breakup with a lover or a breakup between a good friendship. They are painful. I learned that I am not the giant of my dreams, nor the dwarf of my fears, but I am one person with one small part in the theater of life. And I have even a smaller purpose in its uncomprehensible overall purpose. Stop in awe to appreciate your life like a child with its first kaleidoscope. Happiness is not complicated. Don't get lost in a box of broken glass from your past. Don't 
tie yourself to the balloon of tomorrow's dream of perfect life and happiness. Rather, remain steady and reliable as the magically enhanced iron hammer of Thor, finding meaning and contentment in making the most out of the moment. You spent your whole life to this moment. You have worked to get here. Let it be of consequence. Go to bed tonight knowing it was a good day and a good day to God. Thanks to SGA. Thanks to Jan and my friends that are attending. Thanks to the students who thought that this was worth listening to and stayed. Thanks to my colleagues for supporting me. And with that, I'd like to say thank you completely.